Falcon is in countdown. Falcon 9 is in startup. Dragon, SpaceX, go for launch. You are looking live at Launch Complex 39A at Kennedy Space Center. In just over 27 minutes, this Falcon 9 rocket will launch the 29th Commercial Resupply Services mission from both NASA and SpaceX to the International Space Station. Good evening and welcome to live coverage of the CRS-29 launch. I'm NASA's Jasmine Hopkins. Today's launch is the first live broadcast available on NASA's newest free streaming platform, NASA+. Plus. Scan the QR code on your screen now for more mission coverage, new original content, and to put the NASA universe at your fingertips. For CRS-29, fueling of the Falcon 9 began about 12 minutes ago, and we're counting down to an instantaneous launch at 8.28 and 14 seconds Eastern Time. This mission will deliver over 6,000 pounds of science supplies and equipment to the space station. And commercial resupply missions help NASA and our partners continue research to better our life right here on Earth and help us explore deep space. So let's go now to SpaceX headquarters in Hawthorne, California, where Jesse Anderson is standing by to tell us more about the vehicle supporting today's mission. Jesse? Thanks, Jasmine. Hello, everyone. My name is Jesse Anderson, and I'm a manufacturing engineering manager for Falcon here at SpaceX. It's great to be covering today's mission in partnership with NASA, marking SpaceX's 81st launch of the year. Now, on your screen in a second, there you go. You can see a live view of SpaceX's two-stage Falcon 9 rocket with our Dragon spacecraft at the very top. Today marks SpaceX's sixth and final mission to the space station for 2023. And in fact, this will mark the most flights Dragon has flown to the orbiting laboratory in any single year. Since taking flight in 2010, Dragon remains one of the few vehicles that can deliver significant cargo to the space station and the only vehicle that can deliver cargo from the space station. It's a fully autonomous vehicle, which means it's capable of flying itself to and from its destinations. Today, Dragon has visited the station 38 times and transported more than 300,000 pounds of cargo back and forth from the orbiting laboratory. It's also the first private spacecraft to take humans to the space station. Falcon 9 and Dragon were both designed with reflight in mind, and the vehicle hardware is built to support multiple missions with minimal refurbishment. Today's Dragon is flying for its second time and marks SpaceX's 21st reuse of the vehicle. Below Dragon is Falcon 9, which you can think of as two rockets built in one. The lower part, which is also the larger part of the rocket, is called the first stage. The first stage has nine Merlin 1D engines, which accelerate the vehicle through the Earth's atmosphere and into various orbits in space. At the top of the first stage is the black inner stage, and above that is the Falcon 9 second stage. The two stages will separate about two and a half minutes into flight, and then the second stage will ignite its single Merlin vacuum, or what we call the MVAC engine, which is the 10th engine on the rocket, to carry Dragon to its desired orbit. Now, like Dragon today, Falcon 9, the Falcon 9 first stage, is flying for its second time as well, and we plan to recover it back on land at Landing Zone 1, located at Cape Canaveral Space Force Station in Florida, completing the first return to launch site for a Dragon cargo, cargo mission. Now, so far, we've reflown 214 first stages, and that includes Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy. If successful, it will mark the 243rd recovery of an orbital class rocket. As the clock approaches T0, let's head over to NASA's Steve Seifeloff at Cape Canaveral to talk about today's weather. Steve, how's it going over there? Well, the weather is terrific, Jesse. 100% go. In the words of Launch Weather Officer Melody Lovin, it's as good as it gets. And with that, welcome inside Hangar AE here at Cape Canaveral Air Force Station in Florida, just a couple miles down from Launch Complex 39A. From here, we're going to monitor the launch team as they take us through tonight's countdown. So far, the nets have been relatively quiet, which is a good sign. The vehicle is healthy. The team's not working any issues. 
The teams performed a hot fire test just a couple days ago to prove the rocket was ready. The brief engine firing of about a second is a routine test that allows the turbo pumps and engine machinery of the Falcon 9 first stage to spin up long enough for engineers to evaluate the system. After that evaluation, the NASA and SpaceX teams yesterday cleared the rocket and spacecraft for launch today. The 45th Space Wing says the Eastern Range is green, and that means our path from here to the International Space Station is clear and safe. Again, the weather tonight is terrific. 100% go. Still, the launch weather officer, Melody Lovin, will be monitoring the clouds for potential violations. There is a 10 to 15 mile an hour wind from the ocean, but that's not nearly enough to affect the rocket as it climbs through the atmosphere and into orbit. After its work is done, the first stage will come back here to land at landing zone one, about a mile or so away. That is different from recent cargo launches to the space station that saw the first stage land offshore on a drone ship. And to save you a Google search, the first cargo mission to see the first stage return to land was CRS-9 back in 2016. Right now, SpaceX is fueling the Falcon 9 with RP-1, or rocket-grade kerosene, and super-cold liquid oxygen. That is minus 297 degrees, and it is also being loaded into the first stage and second stage. And it's that liquid oxygen turning into a gas and venting into the air that is producing the white clouds you see around the rocket. All rockets are designed with valves that open to allow the to allow the oxygen to boil off to maintain the right pressure in the tanks. Those clouds form when the oxygen makes contact with Florida's humid air. Our launch time tonight is 8:28 and 14 seconds and the launch window is instantaneous to put the spacecraft on course to dock with the International Space Station on Saturday, November 11th at 5.20 a.m. Eastern Time. For more on that, let's head over to Chelsea Bayarte inside NASA's Mission Control Center in Houston. Thanks, Steve, and welcome to the International Space Station's flight control room here inside Mission Control. I'm Chelsea Bayarte, live in NASA's Johnson Space Center here in Houston, Texas. Teams of flight controllers are behind me monitoring tonight's launch with Flight Director Garrett Henn at the helm. Mission Control is go for launch, meaning the space station is ready to receive the spacecraft, and we're not tracking any issues that would prevent a docking. From here on out, Mission Controllers will observe the launch and monitor the Dragon vehicle during all milestones of its flight. The astronauts on board are likely to be asleep at the time of launch. There are seven people living aboard the International Space Station now, NASA astronauts Jasmine Mogbelli and Laurel O'Hara, Andreas Mogensen from Denmark, Satoshi Furukawa from Japan, and Roscosmos cosmonauts Konstantin Borisov, Oleg Kononenko, and Nikolai Chub. When the Cargo Dragon arrives on November 11th, it will dock complete. autonomously, but O'Hara and Mogbelli will be on deck to monitor its arrival. The crew will first unpack the more time-sensitive science experiments and cargo, and then, as the week goes on, continue to unpack their delivery. They'll be receiving some pizza kits, olives, an assortment of cheeses, and some holiday treats like pumpkin spice cappuccino, cranberry sauce, and chocolate. So I'm sure they're looking forward to it. In the meantime, here in Mission Control, everything is still a go, and we're looking forward to following along with the Cargo Dragon during its journey to the International Space Station. So for now, let's go back to Kennedy. Jasmine? Thank you so much for those updates, Chelsea and team. We are now at T minus 19 minutes and counting from liftoff of the 29th Commercial Resupply Services mission from NASA and SpaceX. This mission will carry 6,505 pounds of cargo, including supplies to support the crew on board, spacewalk equipment, vehicle hardware, computer resources, and of course, science investigations. So let's take a closer look at what's on board.
Launching on this mission is part of NASA's first two-way laser communications relay system known as Illuma-T. After attaching to the outside of the space station, this laser communications terminal will send and receive data through NASA's LCRD satellite on orbit. Using invisible infrared light, laser communications can transmit data up to 100 times faster than traditional radio frequency systems. Illumit brings this capability to the International Space Station, enabling more data to be transmitted and received. And of course, more data means more discoveries. Also on this mission is the Atmospheric Waves Experiment, known as AWE. This heliophysics experiment will capture the first global observations of atmospheric gravity waves that form near the surface and impact Earth's upper atmosphere. Increasing our understanding of these waves could teach us more about Earth's atmosphere, climate, and near-Earth space weather. AWE is also part of what NASA is calling the Heliophysics Big Year, a global celebration of solar science and the sun's influence on Earth and the entire solar system. Our work in low Earth orbit is of course paving the way to deep space as we shoot for the moon and beyond. Around this time last year, Artemis 1 lifted off and for Artemis 2, NASA plans to send a crew of four astronauts around the moon farther than humanity has ever gone before. To learn how about we're getting there, there uh, let's check out our Artemis Moon Minute. Preparations for NASA's Artemis II mission are underway at Kennedy Space Center. Engineers inside the Neil Armstrong Operations and Checkout Building connected the two major components of the Artemis II Orion spacecraft, the crew and service modules. Once in space, these important pieces of hardware will fly the Artemis II crew around the moon and back. The 10 solid rocket booster motor segments for the Artemis II Space Launch System rocket arrived by rail at Kennedy, traveling from Utah across eight states in specialized transporters. Kennedy teams also are conducting several water deluge tests at Launch Pad 39B, releasing approximately 400,000 gallons of water onto the mobile launcher's deck, flame hole, and the pad's flame deflector. By helping to deflect overpressurization and suppress the sound produced at liftoff, the water deluge system is critical for protecting the crew, rocket, spacecraft, and pad structures during launch. That's your Artemis Moon Minute. The Artemis missions intend to land the first woman and first person of color on the moon. And these goals are characterized by NASA's graphic novel, First Woman. This is the fictional story of Callie Rodriguez, the first woman to explore the lunar surface. Her struggles and triumphs were inspired by the lives of many real NASA astronauts, like Jasmine McBelly and Laurel O'Hara, who are part of the current space station crew. The second volume of this story with new characters and new technologies is available now in both English and Spanish. And the astronauts on station are in for a real treat because we're sending them a copy with today's launch. You can follow Callie's adventures on NASA's websites and our social media. Now we're just about T-minus 14 minutes and counting from liftoff of CRS-29 from both NASA and SpaceX to the International Space Station. So let's bring back Jesse now to tell us more about SpaceX and their efforts to explore the moon, Mars, and beyond. Jesse. Thanks, Jasmine. As many of you may already know, SpaceX's ultimate mission is to make life multiplanetary. To get us there, we've been developing a fully and rapidly reusable transportation system called Starship, the most powerful launch system ever developed and designed to carry passengers and cargo to Earth orbit, the moon, and planetary destinations like Mars. Starship's first fully integrated flight test back in April provided numerous lessons learned that directly contributed to several upgrades to both the vehicle and ground infrastructure to improve the probability of success on future flights. Our second flight test could launch as soon as mid-November pending regulatory approval, which is just around the corner. This next test will debut a hot stage separation system and a new electronic thrust vector control or TVC system for super heavy Raptor engines, in addition to reinforcements to the pad foundation and a water cooled steel flame deflector, among many other enhancements. Building bases or even cities on Mars will require huge amounts of cargo and eventually crew. So we're designing Starship from the beginning to carry hundreds of tons of cargo into space and be able to refuel in orbit. 
before Mars, Starship will play a key role in the exploration of the moon. We're providing the lunar lander, which will return astronauts to the lunar surface for the first time in more than 50 years under NASA's Artemis missions. With the ability to deliver cargo and people to the lunar surface, we'll be ready to help humanity build a sustainable presence on the moon and learn how to live off world before the next steps to Mars. Today, however, we are going a little closer to home with our Dragon spacecraft, where all of our learning on human space trans transportation began. And all the work and advancement we continue to make with Dragon in low Earth orbit will continue to pave the way for our future deep space missions with Starship. And now let's, I'll turn it back to Jasmine at KSC to take a look at one of the payloads flying on today's mission. Jasmine? Thanks so much, Jesse. Yes, on today's mission, we are launching seeds from the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma. And here to tell us more about the Growing Hope Initiative is Jacqueline Putman. Thank you so much for being here, Jackie. Hello, to and Jasmine. It's very nice to be here. Um, my name is Jacqueline Harjo Putman. I am the co uh, coordinator for Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma. This is National um, Heritage Month, so this is Native American Month, so this is a very important month for us. We're sending up our traditional seeds in this, in this. We're very, very excited about this. These are seeds that came down the Trail of Tears. These are seeds that were sown in the hems of our, our ancestors' garments, so they knew when they left Mississippi that they would have to have food to start over. So they had the forethought, and, and, and they would have never dreamed where we're going today. Right, Jacqueline, there's a lot of emotional significance to these seeds. Absolutely. So can you tell us about, you know, you guys are going to plant them at Jones Elementary. How are these going to inspire the next generation? Oh, this is exciting. When they come back, what we're going to do is take them to Jones Academy. It's a Native American school that we have. And they're going to plant them. We're going to do the STEM program. We're going to do a side-by-side -side testing for what has been on Earth, what's gone out of space, do a comparison. Um, we're getting these kids excited about science. We want to get new astronauts. We want them to know they have a future. The, that this is something that they can do. This is not out of range. Right. That this is something that they can have as well. Exactly. Jacqueline, we actually showed some pictures on the screen of the different things that are going to be planted. What seeds, uh, what kind of seeds are you sending? Ah, we're sending our, our traditional tanchi flower corn. It can grow up to 20 feet tall. We've grown it to 18 and a half feet. This is what we grind up and make our banaha bread. Mm -hmm. We're sending our Choctaw sweet potato squash. It can last on the shelf up to a year. It's high in manganese, magnesium, zinc, vitamin A, and iron. And this is hoping foods that will hold the astronauts will hopefully cake and grow themselves because they last, they're, they're good for you. So, and then we have our Tanchi, I mean, we have our um, uh, Smith peas, we have Chukvi peas. These are just really prolific peas that do really well mm -hmm. indoors, outdoors, and, and they're high in iron and they're really prolific. So we're really hoping that they'll put these to use because it, that is that is awesome. Jackie, how are you going to incorporate this into the STEM curriculum? We're, well, actually, what we're doing is we're building a new garden. We've been talking about building a brand new garden over at Jones Academy mm -hmm. for this program so we could have extra um, produce for the kids to study and get them interested in this program so that can lead to college education, to NASA. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, <laughs> exactly. who could ever believe that, that we would be here at NASA today? Right. And we're kicking off Native American Month, so we're very excited and very honored. That is fabulous. Very poignant, very good timing for this. Thank you so much, Jackie Putman. Mm -hmm. So this science and all the science launching today is made possible by the International Space Station, which celebrates 25 years of operation this month. Here's a look at some of the highlights from the past few decades on the orbiting laboratory. The ISS is the most incredible wonder of the modern world. Christina Cook, the first one through the hatch. We're, we're pushing boundaries. We're doing things that nobody else was doing. about the space station turning 25 keep an eye on nasa's social media channels for a video series debuting this monday november 13th the space station truly is a wonder it is the brightest the third brightest object in the sky and measuring about the size of a professional football field it can be seen with just the naked eye as it orbits the earth at over 17,000 miles per hour nasa is making it easier than ever for you to spot the station Scan the QR code on your screen now to download the all-new Spot the Station app on your mobile device, available on both iOS and Android. 
The app alerts you when the station is passing over your hometown and even lets you track its location in real time. Right now, there are seven people living and working on the space station, making up the Expedition 70 crew. This expedition began on September 27th, and the team represents several international agencies, NASA, ESA, JAXA, and Roscosmos. During their long duration stay in low Earth orbit, they will research heart health, cancer treatments, space manufacturing techniques, and more to benefit life on and off the planet. CRS-29 is expected to dock to the space station this Saturday. That's November 11th at 5.20 a.m. And NASA astronauts Jasmine McBelly and Laurel O'Hara will be monitoring the operation to ensure all this cargo is delivered safely. All right, we're marching towards launch at T minus seven minutes and counting for liftoff of CRS-29. So let's bring back Steve here on Florida Space Coast and Jesse live at SpaceX headquarters in Hawthorne, California to walk us through the final moments of countdown and liftoff. Take it away. Thank you, Jasmine. It is just under seven and a half minutes until launch and the SpaceX team is working no significant issues and the vehicle is healthy. Weather is 100% go for T0 and the range is ready to support today's mission. At this point, rocket propellant one or RP1 fuel is completely loaded on the second stage and nearly complete on the first stage. Liquid oxygen or LOX loading is currently underway on both stages and Engine will complete at the T minus two minute mark. We just heard a call out for engine chill. We're also loading helium gas into both stages. Falcon 9 uses helium as a pressurant to backfill the propellant tanks as liquid oxygen and RP-1 are consumed by the Merlin engines during ascent. Helium load began before the broadcast went live and will continue to top off until about a minute and a half before launch. And SpaceX performed that engine chill just a few seconds ago, around T minus seven minutes. That's when the team flowed a small amount of liquid oxygen at minus 297 degrees into the Merlin stage engine's turbo pumps. Complete. And you may have heard the call there. Stage one fuel load is complete. They're basically doing that engine chill. They're basically prepping the propulsion system for the full flow of liquid oxygen. And by doing this, they avoid a thermal shock to the system and that ensures that engine startup goes well. Dragon also began its startup sequence at T minus 35 minutes when it coordinated timing with the Falcon 9 rocket. The spacecraft is currently undergoing vehicle health checks. It'll enter terminal count at about T minus five minutes with the next big step just a minute before liftoff when Dragon will transition to internal power. And you can see on your screen, there are clamp arms beneath the Dragon vehicle. Once uh, those begin to open up, that'll be coming up here shortly in just about uh, under a minute now. Uh, those clamp arms will open up and that'll allow the transporter erector, which is that large trusted structure that you see on your screen next to the vehicle, that will begin to attract away from the vehicle. The transporter erector, the TE, is used for vehicle rollout Dragon and to route- Dragon's on internal power. to route propellants and electrical power to the vehicle in preparation for launch. Now, once the clamp arms are fully opened, that'll allow uh, some room for that TE to be able to move back from the vehicle. In these last few minutes before T0, Falcon 9 is performing final health checks on its primary communications, avionics, and propulsion systems in preparation for flight. We may hear calls that engines are Trump sufficiently chilled as we get it as we get, get a little closer to liftoff, and then we did hear that call out that they are preparing for strong back retract. That is the TE that I just mentioned. And maybe a little hard to see, but the clamp arms should be opening very slowly there. Again, they are the arms just below the dragon that you see there on your screen. And there you can see those clamp arms opening up. And again, as a reminder, the booster on your screen is flying for its second time and will be landing back on land at landing zone one, which is not too far from the launch site. And there you can see that the clamp arms look like they're fully open now. That transport erector can now begin to move away from the vehicle. It will also be pretty slow and slight, but just enough to allow some room for the vehicle for liftoff. 
And at T-minus 3 minutes, 22 seconds and counting, we are waiting for a call for Stage 1 liquid oxygen loading complete. This launch will take about 6,000 pounds of hardware, crew supplies, and science to the space station. Stage 1, one locks load complete. And there we have the call we were waiting for. Stage 1 locks load complete. That is the uh, liquid oxygen. One of the uh, larger pieces of equipment that uh, CRS-29 is carrying tonight is a technology demonstrator. It's called Illuma-T, and it'll transmit data to Earth on lasers. Those lasers can hold a lot more data than previous communications equipment, and this trial will show how that rush of data can help researchers learn a lot more about their work on the station. Dragon will be docked to the space station for about a month before returning home. At T minus 2 minutes 25 seconds and counting, we are awaiting the um, checkouts of the second stage thrust vector control actuators. And this is often referred to as an engine wiggle test. This is when SpaceX moves the thrust nozzle on the second stage slightly to make sure the guidance hardware, guidance software, and hardware is ready for flight. SpaceX does the exact same test on the first stage engines just seconds before ignition. Stage two, lock load complete. And great call out there. Stage two LOX load is complete, which means that propellant loading is now complete on both stages Dragon of the Falcon 9. Dragon is also performing its final health checks to make sure that all the vehicle's primary systems are ready for its rendezvous with the International Space Station. You may have noticed that the there's some white clouds around the vehicle there on your screen. Those clouds are normal. That is the chilled gas above the liquid tank liquid surface for the liquid oxygen that we vent out overboard to maintain pressure in the tank as needed. And once that cold gas comes into contact with that warmer air, it creates those white clouds that you see there. And we are at T minus one minute, five seconds and counting. Soon the Falcon 9 computers will enter startup mode. Falcon 9 is in startup. And there we have the call from the, the launch countdown. director. Falcon 9 computers have entered startup mode, and the Dragon spacecraft is on internal power. Both stages are now pressurizing for launch. And LD, it, go for launch. And there we have the on-time call of the SpaceX launch director verifying we are go for launch this evening. Liftoff scheduled for 8.28 p.m. Eastern Time and 14 seconds. At launch, the International Space Station will be flying 249 mi 259 miles over the Arabian Sea near the coast of Oman. We are 15 seconds to launch and Give counting. 15 seconds to counting. T minus five, four, three, two, one, ignition. Liftoff. And liftoff of CRS-29 carrying cargo research and a laser downrange. And a laser communication pressure is nominal. A laser communications demonstrator to the International Space Station now in its 25th year of orbital operations. Seconds, Falcon 9 has successfully lifted off from historic launch complex 39A in Florida. We are now coming up on max Q in just about 15 seconds or so. That is the Falcon point 9 of maximum aerodynamic. That's the point of maximum aerodynamic pressure that the vehicle will go through during its flight. Max Q. Great call out there. We have passed through Max Q. Now, with that, we have five events coming up that will be back to back. First will be main engine cutoff. Main engine is that what you see on your screen. Those nine Merlin engines light are lit up right now. 
but we will have Miko, which is main engine cutoff, and that's where we'll shut down all of those engines that you see there on your screen. That'll slow the vehicle down in preparation for the next event called stage separation, which is where the first and second stages will separate from each other. Then the first stage will perform a flip to head back to our launch site for landing, while the second stage continues to light its Merlin vacuum engine to boost Dragon to low Earth orbit during SES-1, or second stage start one. And the last event will be the first stage starting up its one minute long boost back burn. Again, those events are coming up here in a few seconds. Main engine cutoff, stage separation, stage one flip, second stage engine start, and the boost back burn for that first stage vehicle. Mika. Stage separation confirmed. Stage one, condition. boost back startup. Love those views on your screen. You could see stage separation with the first stage heading back to land and the MVAC engine on your screen lit up. And on your left hand side there on your screen, you can see the first stage in its boost back burn. Some really awesome views there. On your right hand screen is a view from the second stage looking at the MVAC engine. Again, this is just about a minute burn for this boost back burn on the first stage. It is the first of three burns required to bring the first stage back to landing zone one. Stage one, boost back, shut down. And we just heard that call out and you can see as the engine shut down on your screen, that concludes the boost back burn for the first stage vehicle. If you're just tuning in, you're watching a live webcast for the 29th commercial resupply mission to the International Space Station for NASA. This is SpaceX's 81st mission for 2023 and the sixth and final Dragon flight to the International Space Station this year. We lifted off from Kennedy Space Center's Launch Complex 39A just about four minutes ago. And as a reminder, today's mission marks the second flight for this Falcon 9 booster, which previously supported the Crew-7 launch earlier this year in August. This is also the first return to launch site for a cargo mission, which helps improve refurbishment and relight times for Falcon 9. And what you're seeing on your screen again is a live view on the second stage, looking at the MVAC engine there. For the first stage, in order to make its way back to landing zone one. It does have a couple more burns to execute. The next burn is the entry burn, and that's for, where we will relight the vehicles three are of on the a nine normal Merlin trajectory. Great call outs there, nominal trajectories for both vehicles. The entry burn is where we will relight three of the nine Merlin 1D engines. This will help to slow the stage down as it re-enters back into the upper parts of the Earth's atmosphere. Then the third and final burn will be the landing burn. That is a single engine burn. The center E9 engine helps bring the vehicle speed down rapidly just before touching down on the landing zone. And again, the M1D engines have about 190,000 pounds of thrust, which is just enough lighting one engine to touch down for landing today. We are just about 15 seconds or so away from that entry burn beginning on the first stage vehicle. We do use four grid fins on the first stage to help guide the vehicle back to its landing zone. They are four hypersonic grid fins compromised of titanium that are positioned near the top of the first stage. Stage one entry burn startup. There's that call out. The entry burn has begun. This burn will last just about 15 seconds Stage one, or so. entry burn shutdown. 
and very quick burn. But as you can see, those engines shut down on your screen. That concludes the entry burn for the first stage vehicle. And you could kind of see the grid fins there um, with a little gleam of light on your screen. Stage one, FTS has saved. The vehicles the continue to follow the nominal trajectory. Excellent call outs. The first stage vehicle also has four landing legs near the base of the vehicle and that they Stage are, one, are used, they're deployed just a few seconds before touchdown of the vehicle. And if successful, this will mark the 243rd time that we've recovered a first stage booster and that includes Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy missions. Stage one landing burn. There's that call out. The landing burn has begun. You can see it there on your left-hand screen. Let's watch as Falcon 9 touches down. Stage one landing leg deploy. Stage one landing confirmed. And an awesome sight to see. As you can see, the Falcon 9 first stage that supported today's mission landed for its second time and has previously supported the Crew 7 mission in August earlier this year. This marks the 238th successful landing guidance. for for an orbital class rocket. Now next up in a few seconds, just about 20 seconds or so, will Stage be the shutdown of the shutdown of the MVAC engine that you see ignited there on your screen. That event is called SECO, or Second Engine Cutoff, and that will be the first uh, shutdown of the of this MVAC engine. SECO. Nominal orbit insertion. Great news, we have just had SECO and heard a confirmation of good nominal insertion. At T plus nine minutes into the mission, we are coming up on the last major task for stage two, commanding separation of Dragon, which is a couple minutes from now. We expect to have a live video of Dragon separation from the trunk looking back at stage two. CRS-29 will be joining the Crew-7 vehicle currently on orbit. So we'll be back to having two Dragon spacecraft docked at the International Space Station. As for cargo, today we will be delivering more than 6,500 pounds of science, research, crew supplies, and vehicle hardware to the orbiting laboratory and its crew. And to date, SpaceX has sent and brought back over 300,000 pounds of crew and cargo to and from the space station. Again, the Dragon separation from Falcon 9 second stage should be coming up here in just about a minute or so. And as a reminder, this is the second flight for this Dragon capsule, having previously supported Crew 7's trip to space in August. Today's flight also marks the 21st reuse of a Dragon vehicle overall. Dragon has 16 Draco thrusters, each with the capability to deliver 90 pounds of force. There are four pairs of these three thrusters spaced evenly around the capsule, and that helps uh, control and guide the vehicle, as well as four forward bulkhead thrusters underneath the nose cone. Now today, the vehicle does not have super Draco thrusters, seats, or life support systems, as it's not carrying crew, and this saves on weight in space and also allows for a faster refurbishment time. Now, while initial designs of Dragon carried solar arrays extended outward from the trunk, the cylindrical structure located directly behind the Dragon capsule, the current Dragon has these arrays fixed directly to the trunk. And you may see a dark side of the trunk and a light side of the trunk. The dark side is those solar panels, while the light side is a radiator to help keep the spacecraft cool. Once the Dragon capsule reaches the International Space Station, it will be able to autonomously dock using its navigation sensors, centerline camera, and light detection and ranging, or LIDAR, equipment. 
The Dragon capsule is connected to the trunk beneath it via the trunk claw and connects thermal control, power, and avionics system components between the trunk and the capsule. And another fun fact, once on station, Dragon can serve as an extra module for science payloads lacking room on the space station, which we refer to as Extend the Lab. Dragon separation confirmed. And there you can see on your screen, the Dragon spacecraft has separated from the Falcon 9 second stage. Now, if you're just now joining us, you're watching a live broadcast for the 29th commercial resupply mission to the International Space Station for NASA. This is SpaceX's 81st mission this year and sixth and final Dragon flight to station for 2023. We lifted off just about 12 and a half minutes ago from NASA Kennedy Space Center Launch Complex 39A in Florida. And coming up in just a few moments is will be the nose cone opening for, uh, for the Dragon um, capsule. All right, so that will do it for me here in Hawthorne. So we are going to send it over to Chelsea in Houston to talk us through the nose cone opening. Chelsea? Thank you, Jesse, and welcome back to the International Space Station's Flight Control Room. I'm here with continued live coverage here in Mission Control Houston. We got a view of launch up on the monitors here in the room, and just like you saw at home, the Cargo Dragon spacecraft is making its way to the space station as we speak. As Jesse explained, the spacecraft has already gone through a number of milestones. It separated from the second stage of the Falcon 9 rocket and performed a number of automatic checkouts, doing small firings of the Draco thrusters. The next major milestone that we'll be looking out for here in Mission Control is nose cone deploy. We already got confirmation that these latches, the things that are, are attaching the Dragon nose cone, are starting to come off. This is a process that's going to take a couple of minutes, and then that nose cone will begin to pop off. So let's talk a little bit about why we want this nose cone deployed. The nose cone protects the docking hardware that is needed to attach the Cargo Dragon spacecraft to the space station for its one month stay. So nose cone deploy is a critical step in our timeline today. The nose cone also unveils four forward bulkhead thrusters, which Dragon will use for its major burn maneuvers to catch up with the space station. There will be a checkout of these engines just minutes after nose cone deploy. And the nose cone also protects crew Cargo Dragon's navigational sensors during ascent. These rendezvous and tracking elements help the spacecraft understand where it is and where it needs to go to reach the space station. So over Overall, the nose cone is there to protect the docking hardware, the forward bulkhead thrusters, and the rendezvous and tracking elements during launch. And now the nose cone is in the process of opening up so the spacecraft can use those elements. There are two sets of six latches positioned around the docking ring, so 12 latches total need to be unlatched before the nose cone can swing open. This could take a couple of minutes to complete, and once they're open, then the nose cone will start to slowly swing open. This is a process that could take um, an additional five minutes, and we hope to get live views of this from the Cargo Dragon spacecraft later on. This mission is all about cargo. It's astronaut food, it's science experiments, it's hardware all being delivered to the crew's doorstep in space. They're in their sleep period right now, but they'll wake up to the news that their package is on its way. NASA astronauts Laurel O'Hara and Jasmine Mogbelli will monitor the spacecraft's arrival on Saturday. We're waiting for confirmation of a good nose cone deployment of the spacecraft, which can take a few minutes for those latches to open. But after the nose cone is open, Mission Control will continue to monitor the spacecraft's journey, including a scheduled phase burn that the Cargo Dragon will perform autonomously.
That burn is expected to begin just a short while from now with the engines firing for close to 12 minutes in duration. Going into Friday, the spacecraft will perform an additional five burns, all with the goal of fine-tuning Cargo Dragon's path to the International Space Station. Moving on to early Saturday here in Houston, the spacecraft will be in the vicinity of the space station. A team here in Mission Control will work closely with SpaceX headquarters in Hawthorne, California. They'll monitor as the spacecraft autonomously moves through the steps and checks required for docking. Today's Cargo Dragon will be parked in the space station's Node 2 forward port. Node 2 is also known as the Harmony Module, and it has been unoccupied since NASA's SpaceX Crew-6 crew departed the space station in September of this year. The Crew-6 spacecraft was a Crew Dragon. Its departure brought NASA astronauts Steve Bowen and Woody Hoberg home, along with their crew members Sultan al Niadi and Andrei Fijayev but in its place will be today's Cargo Dragon when it docks on November 11th. NASA's Anna Schneider will be here in Mission Control with live coverage of docking Saturday morning. But this spacecraft has a lot of milestones to hit before it arrives, including the opening of the nose cone. Uh, it's a step that the spacecraft is working on right now. We're waiting for confirmation that the uh, all 12 latches around the docking ring are open. And those rings are open and the nose cone is starting to open up. So you're getting the view from the inside of the Cargo Dragon spacecraft. We're looking at the nose cone now. This is the very tip of the spacecraft, the tip of the, the rocket you were looking at on the launch pad. This is the nose cone opening up and right underneath it, we'll get a view of the vacuum of space. This nose cone will stay in this open position until the very end of its mission, closing once again just before the spacecraft re-enters Earth's atmosphere to provide some additional protection to that same hardware. This Cargo Dragon spacecraft is expected to return next month, undocking from the space station's Harmony module in early December, bringing back science experiments and other supplies back to Earth. Again, on your screen, you were seeing some motion moments ago. This is the nose cone of the Cargo Dragon spacecraft opening up. This maneuver was allowed by 12 latches that, that unhooked themselves, one set of six at a time, allowing free motion of the, of the nose cone that you see in motion here. This nose cone deployment started just almost seven minutes ago, and now the nose cone is opening, and we're looking at the vacuum of space from the point of view of the Cargo Dragon spacecraft. Just because it's no longer on your screen does not mean it's fully open. It has a couple of degrees more to go before we get confirmation of good nose cone deploy. As a reminder, opening up this nose cone allows for access to the docking hardware underneath, critical for the Cargo Dragon spacecraft to reach, to attach itself to the space station. It also unveils the forward bulkhead Draco thrusters and navigational sensors that Dragon will help to understand its position in space and also make it find its way to the space station. We've temporarily lost our live views, but so you're looking at a live view of Mission Control Houston as we continue to monitor the nose cone deployment. And just like that, we just got confirmation that nose cone deployment is complete. This is a critical milestone for the Cargo Dragon spacecraft on its way to the International Space Station. Once again, we got con confirmation that the Cargo Dragon nose cone has deployed. I do have a special guest joining me today. Joining me on the phone is Christy Depletion, Deputy Manager of the International Space Station Inter Integration Office. Christy, are you with us? I'm here. Thanks, Chelsea. Christy, awesome launch today. Uh, I want to ask you a couple of questions about Dragon. So when it arrives, the crew schedule gets increasingly busy with science and research. Can you tell us some of the important work that they'll be doing? Sure. That was a beautiful launch. Oh, my gosh. And the booster landing was amazing. 
Um, so the crew is very busy when it arrives. They're actually very busy even preparing for Dragon before it docks. Uh, the crew talks with payload developers to prepare for experiments they'll be doing. Uh, they also have a conference with our inventory and stowage officer to discuss the cargo being delivered and any changes to how they'll execute the unpacking and packing plan uh, during the 30-day mission. The crew then does prepare for docking and ingress, and once Dragon is docked, the crew will build, perform their leap checks before they open the hatch. But yes, once Dragon arrives and the hatch is open, the crew gets right into work and will begin working on some of the experiments that were launched. One of these that I find interesting is from the European Space Agency um, called Cerebral Aging. It's a study of the effect of spaceflight and durability in space uh, on cerebral organoids. Uh, an organoid is an artificially grown mass of cells or tissue that resembles an organ, so in this case, the brain. The overall goal of this experiment is to study the aging process in cerebral organoids derived from normal individuals and those patients with accelerated aging uh, that may or may not be displaying hypersensitivity to UV radiation conditions, similar to what living organisms are exposed to during spaceflight. So this experiment will help us learn more about the effects of space conditions on our brains uh, as we prepare for even longer duration space flights. Um, and of course, the crew will be busy unpacking Dragon, and they are always excited to get the fresh food. Uh, as you mentioned earlier, we have some holiday-type food the crew can enjoy, like turkey, cranberry sauce, cheeses, and chocolate. So I think they'll enjoy that a lot. A reward for their hard work. Some science and some goodies. Sounds yeah. awesome. So looking ahead one month from now, Dragon has completed its mission. Uh, can you share some of the hardware or research that Dragon is going to bring, bring home back to Earth? Yes, that's a great question. Our return missions are very important, just like launches are. Uh, they bring home uh, research cargo as well as systems hardware that needs to be refurbished before we return it back to station. The station is like our home and has equipment that needs repair and maintenance occasionally, too. Uh, we are planning to return a few items on this flight for repair, including a resistive exercise device flywheel. Uh, that provides the forces to, sim to simulate some 1G exercise for the crew. Another is a camera assembly that provides video feedback during our on-orbit robotic operations. And we're also returning the hardware that is part of the environmental control system for the plant habitat for repair. So this control unit um, keeps an eye on the humidity and other environmental factors within the plant habitat. So if you've seen pictures of tomatoes or peppers recently from station, they may have been growing in that facility. Um, as far as the research over the next month, the crew will complete many, many experiments, and then a lot of that research will come home for the scientists to have um, in a pretty rapid um, timeline. So that allows them to get their results pretty quickly. Christy, thank you so much for joining us here today. Sure, thanks for having me. So back here in the International Space Station's flight control room, flight controllers are going to continue monitoring the next milestones of the Cargo Dragon as, it's make its, as it makes its way back, or as it makes its way to the International Space Station. They're going to continue to look for some upcoming milestones uh, going into Friday and then Saturday as the Dragon arrives into the vicinity of the space station, getting ready for docking. So that's it here from Mission Control. Back to Jasmine and Kennedy. Thank you so much, Chelsea. That's going to wrap up our launch coverage of the 29th Commercial Resupply Services mission from both NASA and SpaceX to the International Space Station. As a reminder, docking is set for Saturday. That's November 11th at 5 20 a.m. and live coverage for that operation is scheduled at 3:45 a.m. Eastern. Thanks again for joining us tonight. We'll leave you with a replay of the beautiful launch. And until next time, go NASA, go SpaceX, and go CRS-29. T-minus five, four, three, two, one. Ignition. Look up. And lift off of CRS-29 carrying cargo research and a laser downrange. And a laser communication pressure is nominal. A laser communications demonstrator to the International Space Station now in its 25th year of orbital operations.